Collective Insights is a voyage through topics and technologies revolutionizing human well-being. Groundbreaking approaches for a better world and a better life await you. Welcome to Collective Insights. Collective Insights and the work we do at Neurohacker Collective is made possible from the support of our community and the sales of our product, Qualia. Qualia is a comprehensive mental enhancement supplement designed to improve focus, mood, and flow state. Learn more about Qualia at neurohacker.com and use coupon code COLLECTIVEINSIGHTS20 for $20 off your first order. Welcome to the Neurohacker Collective podcast, Collective Insights. My name is Daniel Schmachtenberger. I'm with Research and Development here at Neurohacker Collective, and we are really happy to have a good friend of ours, Michael Menino, here with us today. Uh, Michael's area of research are directly related to our approach and philosophy and epistemology here at uh, Neurohacker. Uh, he works in complex systems neuroscience, so he's uh, just weeks away from finishing his uh, dissertation at the Center for uh, Complex Systems and Brain Science, <clears throat> and has been for quite some time a professor of philosophy, uh, critical thinking, philosophy of mind, uh, etc., philosophy of economics, and he also happens to be a biohacker personally and teach on the topics of embodied cognition and how working with the body as a whole is related to uh, optimizing the mind. So we're really delighted to uh, meet Michael and we're happy to have him here on the show and share some of his uh, research and insights on complexity in the brain. Thanks for having me, Daniel. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm honored that you uh, would have me on this podcast and I'm looking forward to our conversation. So. Thanks once again. So let's let's dive in, and you know some of the listeners here at um, Neurohacker have heard me talk about why we need a complex system science approach to medicine and to psychiatry, to psychopharmacology, um, etc., and why modeling the human as a complex system is important as opposed to a reductionist approach to medicine. But we haven't really talked at much length about what that means for those who aren't familiar. And I think okay. most of the audience will be interested because these are very powerful tools for understanding, but not, not familiar. So what is complexity science? How is it different than just saying science? And why is it relevant at all in any system and particularly in human systems? <clears throat> I think, right, so um, I myself haven't heard of complex systems or complexity science in uh, since I started my PhD. So it was actually something new to me. I was looking to get into cognitive neuroscience, uh, but I found the com complex systems program. So I was introduced to it then. As a field, it's actually quite recent. It's about, uh, you know, let's say 20, 25, 30 years old. And so I'm giving some kind of meta, broader uh, uh, definitions or descriptions of complex systems right now. I mean, so it's a new field. Um, and if there's, there's no unified consensus, I would say right now in complex systems itself, you have different people studying different aspects of it, uh, what it means, we're still figuring out what it means, um, and how to approach it methodologically and conceptually. So I'll, I'll I mean, you have different people like Scott Kelso, who's written the complementary nature and dynamical patterns, which have been called classic text in complexity science, but then you have, uh, Yanir Bar Yam up at the New England Complex Systems Institute who wrote uh, Dynamics of Complex Systems and, um, and uh, Making Things Work, which I actually have the book right here. This is an excellent uh, classic text, I would say, for, uh, which is becoming a classic test for comp complexity science. But, um, and more than that, you also have a bunch of institutes and centers now opening um, uh, at all different kinds of universities and think tanks, which you didn't have even probably like 10 years ago. I mean, Santa Fe Institute is one of the biggest ones and that's been for a while, but uh, I, would, I would think that there's some similarities and differences with science versus complexity science. So one of the similarities is that it's still um, a scientific viewpoint of the world, I would say, You're still using the scientific method I put that in quotes because I really don't think there's any such thing as a scientific method per se, but uh, you know, it, it's still using that approach. So there's similarities there. I think some differences in complexity science um, lead to, it's sort of analogous to when I think, uh, you know, in the early 20th century, Newtonian physics was bumping up against 
uh, what Thomas Kuhn called anomalies, right? Um, black body radiation, and of course, Max Planck uh, thought about the quanta, and then Einstein came along and thought about how to think of uh, space and time differently as well. So that, that sort of uh, was a paradigm shift. So I think something happen is happening like that now. We're bumping up against, you know, the, a, a great article was actually written in 1948 by Warren Weaver, who, uh, I, I forget what it's called. I think it's called Science and Complexity. And um, it was early as back in 1948 because already the people were bumping up against it. Uh, scientific, science itself was bumping up against these problems. And he talked about disorganized complexity and organized complexity. And um, disorganized complexity being things like, like from statistical mechanics, right? Uh, uh, describing features, macro features with, in terms of the statistics of like little kinetic motions of molecules or um, galactic, like uh, in cosmology, thinking about galaxies full of hundreds of billions of stars and how they behave gravitationally. Um, but even back, even then, uh, things like nonlinear dynamics, which is a main methodology of complex systems, was beginning to uh, because of was beginning to come about because of things like the three body problem, for example, in orbital mechanics. Um, but so so those I think would, would be classified as disorganized complexity. Organized complexity. Um, how do you describe an ant colony? The behavior of an ant colony. How do you describe the behavior of a whole swarm of birds? How do you describe genetic regulatory networks? Um, how do you write the mathematical, simple kind of set of equations for these kinds of things? Whereas you could do them in relativity for like cosmo cosmological things like, right? Um, so physics started bumping up against that when you started doing the physics of life. And that was one of the main uh, things that organized complexity. So now people are looking, I mean, maybe it's still actually possible to write down um, the behavior of economies with a simple equation, like, the Black-Scholes equation, for example, which also has problems, right? But um, we, we don't know, and, and that's sort of what I think a main difference is, to answer your question, to get back to the original, with that, that's the difference between complexity science and science, right? So, yeah. So I said a lot there, so. <laughs> so let's recap here. Okay. Uh, Eddington defined science as the earnest endeavor to put into order the facts of experience. And so the tools of science have to extend as we get into new domains of experience. So we didn't know there was such a thing as a placebo effect. And then when we right. realized there was, we came up with the placebo controlled trial and double blinding a trial. It was, we added to the methodology of science because there was a new phenomena. And the same is true when we went from Newtonian mechanics, as you were mentioning, to quantum mechanics, because at very, very little scales, it's just different, right? Different kind of stuff. So we extended what we understood. And the same was true at the very large cosmological scale with relativity. And the same was true with certain kinds of systems that had <clears throat> usually huge number of interacting dynamics, sometimes as few as three, usually huge numbers of interacting dynamics, so chaotic and complex systems. Right. And when you're mentioning stable, complex systems, life is one of the classic examples that we look at. And so, what are, so when we're trying to study biology, right, if we're trying to study an ecosystem or, say, a human body or human brain, right. um, what's fundamentally different about studying how a brain works than studying how a computer works? What's different about those kinds of systems? Good question. I think... Um, so as you rightly said, you're, with com complex systems, you're dealing with a system with a large number of components or interacting elements. And that is quite true of, um, of the system that you're mentioning that we've been talking about, like economies, you know, ant colonies and things like that, genetic regulatory networks. You have a, that's what I think a definition of a complex system is, right? I mean, Yanir Baryam would say complexity is defined informationally. That is the minimum amount of information that you could use to describe a system. Now, that's one definition. I mean, colloquially, we'd say a complex system is a system, right, of many, many different parts, but those parts are highly coupled and they're highly interacting. And they interact in such a way that they produce novel properties that um, other simpler systems or complicated systems like a car engine, for example, or a jet engine don't have. So 
those properties have been classically talked about right in the literature as emergence, self-organization, coordination dynamics, pattern formation, symmetry breaking, all of those things. Um, actually, uh, one of the, the most famous articles that was written, I think, in 1972 by P.W. Anderson. It is the most classic paper. It's a short paper in complex systems or complexity science. It's called uh, More is Different. And, and um, he was using symmetry breaking in quantum physics to illustrate that um, there's a problem with the reductionistic hypothesis in sciences, right? Like that psychology is not just applied biology. Um, there's new laws that were discovered that just don't apply on these different levels. And so he ends the article famously by saying, um, he ends it, he, he ends it colloquially and, and fun uh, with kind of a facetious jocular way. And he says, um, Marx, um, said it very well when he said uh, quantitative, like when he was talking about wealthy people, the different classes, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, he said that quantitative differences become qualitative ones. Right? So when you, um, when you add in more and more parts and those parts get coupled, you get qualitatively new distinct features um, that are novel and that also have a downward causal effect on the parts that make them up. And then the second way he, he ended the article was he said, there was a funny conversation, I think, between uh, Fitzgerald and Ernest Hemingway in, in the 20s in Paris. And, and the Hemingway goes, uh, or Fitzgerald goes, um, the rich are different from us. And Hemingway answers, yes, they have more money. In other words, like, so they're different from us in the fact that they have more money. But the fact that they have more money makes them qualitatively different people. Um, which is interesting because now in behavioral economics, a lot of studies are coming out and showing there are right, economic and sociological and psychological and character differences between these things because of that. But that's, that's another story that I don't want to get into too much of a tangent. But So, so those properties. I don't, <clears throat> I don't want to assume that uh, everybody listening knows the term reductionism or top-down causation, et cetera. So okay. let's, actually uh, get it, let's get into those a little bit. Um, cause these are key concepts. So okay. uh, in his paper, he was refuting reductionism. What, what okay. is reductionism? Why is it useful? And what are its limits? What is reductionism? Why is it useful? <clears throat> and what are its limits? Well, uh, let me first by say we, we're all reductionists. I mean, as a scientist, you're a reductionist. Um, that's how science is that, like, uh, in my view, science progresses that way. And it's through reductionism that we actually found out about other things. What is reductionism? It's a, it's an analytical strategy, I would say, of, of breaking down things and explaining them with their parts. Right? If you can figure out what those parts are, right? Um, uh, it, it's it's an analytical strategy that that involves um, trying to explain what the different parts do, and then you add up those parts and you get the whole. Okay, in complex systems, something else happens. It's non-reductionistic in the sense of um, you add up those parts and you get something completely different than you would would have thought. It's, it was unexpected. That's the crude phrase. The the, uh, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. So that's what I think reductionism is. It's a, it's a philosophy, it's a, it's a motivation, it's a strategy, um, and it's worked. It's very useful in the sense of it has allowed us to explore, it's allowed us to, um, well, I'll give you three examples or, or more. It's allowed us to cure disease, like cure polio. The germ theory of disease is, was a reductionistic um, strategy, I think. Uh, it's allowed us to send rockets to the moon. Um, by understanding orbital mechanics and how the planets work, uh, uh, you know, how gravity works. Um, it's allowed us to make decent predictions about hurricanes um, because meteorology, although meteorology was one of the birthplaces of complex systems, so I, I, I really don't want to use this too much. And we're going to talk about why meteorology was one of the, the birthplaces of, of nonlinear dynamics and chaos theory and complex systems. but um, it's reductionistic in the sense of, you know, there's, there's a methodology, there's a mathematics to explain it, and you can explain things with, um, you know, relatively few equations like the Navier-Stokes equations in meteorology, for example, or 
Bernoulli's equations about flow or something or other like that. Um, so th that's why it's useful. It's allowed us to probe deep into the universe and un get a, an understanding of what's going on. Um, it's allowed us to understand that there's a lot more that we don't understand. The reductionist like, hypothesis has allowed that. The, uh, I forget what Einstein said, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible, or actually maybe it was the opposite. <laughs> um, but I can't quite remember the... But uh, yeah, so... So that's why I think it's useful. It's, uh, so to, to clarify, <clears throat> reductionism is an approach where we take something that has some complexity, and to understand it, we try and break it into parts that might be easier to understand. So we look at human physiology by looking at gastroenterology, neurology, oncology, all these different kind of vertical slices. Um, and then we will further slice that and say, well, we're not just going to look at the GI tract, but individual organs, individual tissues, individual cells. <clears throat> so in order to explain how the GI tract works. Right. And so typically in reductionism, we have, we, we ground things like economics or psychology or human behavior in biology and biology and chemistry and chemistry and physics and physics and quantum physics. And, and so we're looking for, what are the most foundational things from which we can construct everything else, everything else. Yeah. And I think that's right. I mean, that's, that's the general idea. That's been the idea um, throughout much of history. So what's an example where you break something into parts, you understand the parts and by understanding those parts, you miss the properties of the whole completely. The brain, <laughs> the brain. Absolutely. My, my object of, of study. Um, and that's where, that's the, your third question, what are some of its limits, right? So, I mean, that, that's all, like, you could talk about this just to back up for a second from even a more philosophical point of view, um, like, like you were saying about economics is made up of, like, markets are made up of people trading, right, or banks trading, or organizations trading. Um, organizations are made up of people. You go down the list. People are made up of brains and physiology. Those things are made up of neurons and cells. Those things are made up of proteins. Proteins are made up of amino acids. And all the way, all the way down, you can even go down to as far as the, the smallest thing we know, which is maybe strings, right? Super string theory. Um, does that mean you can explain um, or predict uh, e an economic crash in terms of string theory? Right. That, that's, that seems like a, it's, it's, a, it's an appropriate question to ask, but it seems like an obvious one. I don't think it's an obvious one because there's complexity there about you know, what are the limits of explanation. I mean, you go back to Laplace's demon and determinism. You know, if there was a Laplace, if there was a demon who knew all of the laws of the universe perfectly and knew all of the positions and velocities, every single particle in the universe at this instant and knew all the laws, you could make a prediction about anything in the future, um, uh, anything that would happen, like me moving my, my finger like this, for example. You could make that prediction at the beginning of time. Right? Um, that's things like quantum mechanics and chaos theory and, and now complexity science have shown those things to be uh, they, those, you know, doubtful or, or they put them in question at least or they, they show them that they're not so obvious, I guess you would say. I think you can actually go further and say <clears throat> that Bell's theorem in pretty much every interpretation of quantum mechanics is a proof of hard random, a proof of non-determinism. Yeah. And so Bell's theorem extending on Heisenberg more powerfully than anywhere else shows the universe is ontologically unpredictable future of unpredictable. Yeah. I, I totally agree. I totally, although there's one interpretation of quantum mechanics, David Bohm's uh, famous, and that's completely deterministic. And well, the, there's this, the de Broglie bomb theory is the, the only one, but right. it does require that everything you process is infinite, which ends up getting uh, yes. functional indeterminism again. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. I just wanted to throw that caveat. Exactly right. Yeah. So the, I mean, back to your question, I think the brain is, is one of the most obvious well, obvious now, but maybe not obvious like 20 or 30 years ago. Certainly not obvious in time of, uh, you know, uh, like Santiago Ramón y Cajal, the, one of the fathers of neuroscience, right? Um, but yeah, the brain is one of the most obvious things where you, you, you look at the parts and you examine the parts in all their detail and um, 
you put those parts together in such a way and you get something that you is, is unexpected. It's novel. It's a novel property. Uh, well, consciousness, I would say, or cognition are novel properties. Um, and, and, and it's, it, it's, it's, it's obvious there. It's not so maybe obvious. A lot of people use examples of, uh, in chemistry, for example, there's plenty of examples in complexity science of chemistry. <clears throat> one obvious one, a colloquial one is, is wetness, right? Do you find, wetness in a single water molecule um you have to define what you mean by wet or wetness in, in not only in terms of a subjective component but an objective component but how many water molecules do you add up to where you get you go from a, a, an atom or a molecule which is not we don't think of wet to something that's wet right um is it an emergent property and what does that mean to say but i think one of the obvious ones is consciousness and even even that is still being questioned. What does that mean to say in its emergent novel property? But back to defining. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Maybe easier for people since consciousness requires the ontologic category shift from subject to object. Exactly. Uh, is just the definition of life, right? That if we look at a cell and the cell respirates, we say, well, what parts does respiration occur in? We, if we take the cell apart and we look at any of the organelles on their own, none of them respirate. If we look at outside of a cell, if we look at any of the molecules that make it up, none of them respirate. So respiration is this emergent property of the cell as a whole system organized in exactly that way. Right. It, it doesn't exist in any of the parts taken separately or the parts rearranged in different ways. So right. it or is like the heart pumping blood is another great example that people use. And so we see in life, we see this everywhere. And it's really interesting. So this is why I was asking the difference between, say, the brain and a computer. Is a computer has a lot of parts and it has a lot of dynamics. And obviously, the computer being on is doing stuff that the screen on its own and the motherboard on its own and the hard drive on its own wouldn't do. They have to be together. But there is still a big difference between the computer and a physiology, which is that the computer has a blueprint for how it's built that fully specifies how all those parts are going exactly. to work together. It's organization by design. So in a complex system, you don't have a blueprint. What do you have? You have self-organization. Right. You have generator functions. Right. That's what I like to think about it. So the, the genome isn't actually a blueprint. It's a generator function for how the system will code proteins to create new architecture in different environments. Okay. Which is why the tree doesn't look like one thing and the human physiology doesn't look like one thing. You lift heavier weights and it starts to change in the presence right. of certain nutrients, it changes. Whereas the computer doesn't do that, right? Yeah. The computer has very fixed structural dynamics. So that, that's the real interesting thing in complex systems is the self-organization, the self-interacting dynamics. And yeah. so I would say there probably is no place where this is more relevant than human physiology and brain specifically because of the degree of complexity. Well, yeah. And to your point, uh, many people have said, I mean, you know, 80 billion neurons massively, massively connected, um, not only locally connected, like in a computer. I want to go back to that actually too, for a second, the computer metaphor, but um, uh, I mean, many people have said it's the most complex system of which we know. Uh, and even 80 billion neurons. I mean, it's even more glial cells, astrocytes and, and uh, things like that. I mean, way more. But back to, I think, for your listeners, um, one, one thing that you, you is written about quite a bit right now in, in the literature and, you know, in, the, uh, in, in different magazines and periodicals and things like that is the computer metaphor uh, for the brain, right? Thinking about the brain as, as a computer, at thinking about the, um, the mind is the software running on the hardware, which are the neurons in the brain, and throughout history, there's been tons of metaphors for the brain, right? Like systems of pulleys, uh, all kinds of hydraulic systems. Um, actually, there's a Sam Harris has a great Waking Up podcast, and uh, he has a great episode where he talks about this with David Krakauer, who is the head of the Santa Fe Institute for Complex Systems. And uh, but you know, the, the listeners should understand that 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 only goes that metaphor goes so far. There's more disanalogies than there are analogies and similarities. I mean. The computer, like you say, the inter, the infor, as an information processor, the inter, information is not integrated in the way that the brain is. So you have connections, of course, in the computer, but those connections are, are, are very local. Whereas you have those connections in the brain, but you also have 
a, a mixture of global connections and local connections, right? So it, the brain has been talked about as a small world network, right? If you've, um, if your listeners have heard about small world networks and what that means, you know, like you can, you can jump to a node in the system, uh, a far away in, uh, in the network or in the system, a far away node, but with not that many hops, right? So the, the average distance between hops is not that great, even though you have a massively connected network. That there's, there's that difference. There's the integrated, as I say, the information is integrated. There's also the neuroplasticity, right? If you, if you uh, break the computer or destroy the CPU or a part of it, it's no longer going to go work. You know, if you can, if you do the same thing to the brain, that's not necessarily true. The brain is anti-fragile in that way. I think um, you can split. So these, are, these are a couple of really critical differences, right? Which is yeah. um, anti-fragility, self-repair, which are properties of self-organization. Yes. Um, but, right. but the other key thing is that, as you were mentioning, in computers, the distinction between hardware and software is pretty clear. Yeah. And which is that every time you run new software, the computer doesn't structurally rearrange itself in a significant way. And that's right. actually not true in the human nervous system, which is that you have this kind of complete coupling between hardware and software where any changes in the physiology affect nature of mind and any processes in mind actually change the structure of brain. Yeah. Perfect. Well said. Well said. And to, to go even <clears throat> further, you know, the, the, the computer's a, uh, I, mean, I mean, you know, the, as a von Neumann machine, right, or a Turing machine, uh, the computer processes information in that way, and so does the brain. But one thing I think further is that the body, like, we'll talk about this later, of course, but the notion of embodied mind and embodied cognition and embodied consciousness, um, software might require hard, like, hardware in a certain way. Uh, and not only that, but the movement of that hardware affects the way the software is running, if, you, if we're continuing with this so, computer metaphor. Although, I, like I said, I think it breaks down very easily. So embodied cognition is a great example of limits of reductionism, where we started by recognizing that there was information processing happening in the brain and the nervous system, but then we assumed it was all happening there. Right. And then have started to recognize maybe the rest of the body is not exclusively just carrying the brain around and right. processing nutrients for it, but is act, is actually doing something else interesting as well. Yes. Um, right. Talk to us about that. Talk to us about what why people psyche changes with fecal transplants and organ <laughs> transplants and movement patterns and. Um. Yeah. So that's that's a great uh, another new field within complex systems. Um, and philosophy of mind, right? So um, I think it originally uh, began, well, began with several philosophers like Maurice Merleau-Ponty and um, Heidegger and uh, some other philosophers talked about this way back when. But one of the most recent, I guess, scientists, neuroscientists and philosophers wrote a, bo wrote a book uh, called The Embodied Mind called uh, Francisco Varela. And... Uh, and he really talked about, along with some others, uh, that uh, Kant, like Alvin Noah now is another philosopher who's written about this within activism. George Lakoff uh, wrote Metaphors We Live By. All these people are different versions of embodied mind. And that's another thing. Embodied mind is really not a whole unified philosophy. There's different aspects of that as well, different things to focus on. But uh, so, yeah, embodied cognition is the fact or, or the the observation, I guess you would say, that, uh, that having a body directly affects and shapes cognitive processes and that um, the mind, having a mind and having cognitive processes might require um, having a body that moves around in an external world and in, a, in an environment and interacts in a dynamical relationship with that environment. The fact that we, we've, in neuroscience and philosophy of mind, have been looking for consciousness in the brain um, all the views uh, like uh, in, in philosophy of mind, like uh, re reductive materialism, eliminative materialism, all these different views have say, well, let, let's look for consciousness and the, the seat of the soul in the mind, uh, which is this in the brain. And now people are thinking that maybe that's the wrong, like Alvin Noah would say, the wrong place to look. That's the wrong way to go. We should probably look for consciousness in the fact that the brain exists in a body that moves. And, and exist in a relationship with the world. Why? Um, because traditional views have uh, bumped up against some limits. Um, 
there's a lot of theories, there's a lot of different physical theories of consciousness and they've all kind of like hit dead ends so far, right? So the neural correlate theories of consciousness, NCCs, which was started by um, Christoph Koch and, uh, you know, looking for, looking for the, the qualia, right, um, of love and the experience of red and the C sharp in terms of, of neurons. So looking for mental states in physical states, right? Looking for the mental states and the mental experiences, looking for those, explaining them in terms of the physical processes that go on in the, in the brain. So uh, there's that. There's, there's also Stuart Hameroff, right, the, the explaining consciousness by uh, looking at the microtubules with Roger Penrose. Quantum theories of consciousness have run up uh, against dead ends. Um, global workspace hypothesis. So the, all these different theories of consciousness and, and, and mind, right, and, and looking for them in terms of what happens in the brain have sort of run up against dead ends. And people were saying, well, wait, maybe we're neglecting the body here. Maybe we're neglecting a, a major component of this. I mean, if you look at the brain, let me get my, my model, right? So if you, I mean, if you just look at the brain, right, essentially, right, this, this first half of the brain is largely devoted to, I mean, if we could, this is a crude description, but essentially what you could do is, is, is you know, the frontal part of the brain is largely devoted to motor acts and motor coordination to action. And the, the back half of the brain is largely devoted to perception and sensation. So you have what's been called the action perception cycle. And um, so, I mean, even just like half of the brain is devoted to moving, right? And, and, to, and to doing motor acts with the body. Um, you know, from, from the simplex example of like talking with your hands or uh, body language or, you know, facial recognition and things like this, all of these different parts of the body affect our consciousness. And, and people started thinking, well, wait, maybe we should not try and explain mental states in terms of just brain states, right, or, or what neurons are doing, but um, what neuron, neurons are doing inside the body and how it moves. So... so I think, I, you were going to say something. Oh, go ahead. I think something that all of the uh, people listening will relate to is that changes in many parts of your physiology, obviously, are going to affect your mind and psyche. You stub your toe, and your psyche is in a very specific state. You have hormones that are out of balance from your that are not primarily neural hormones, right? That are happening in the adrenal glands, or in the thyroid, or in the gonads, and your right. system feels radically different you have food poisoning or something going on in the GI tract, right? So we know that yeah. most of our neurotransmitters are actually produced by a uh, microbiome in the gut. The gut is not traditionally thought of as the nervous system. So we have to have this gut brain axis. Right. And we start realizing that there are these axes everywhere, that the, uh, the anatomy and physiology, the dynamics of all of the body relate to the nature of our mind you know, our yeah. brain, mind, psyche. But then we can extend it a little further, right? And we can say, well, if we just had our brain without the rest of our body, it would we would not have conscious experience in the same way. Uh, yeah, so, right. That's right. Yeah. But then we can say, well, if we just had the entire body without an environment, then that wouldn't work either, right? right. And so we get this nested complexity topic. That is, can I, can I cut you off with just one yeah. thing before I forget? The, one, the latter, what you just said, a great example of that is a famous experiment um, by Hein and Held, I think, the uh, cat experiment. It's kind of, in psychology, it was well recognized. The cats would, um, they put cats, two cats in a carousel, and the carousel have, you know, has a screen on it, so black and white stripes so that they can see movement, right? One cat was in a little gondola, so it couldn't move. The other cat was moving the carousel itself, right? So, but both cats were seeing this, this uh, go by and they did this for like three weeks. Was, um, this is a crude explanation of the experiment, but they did this for three weeks with the little kittens and, and they, um, then they put them out in the world and the cat that uh, could move the carousel and was actually walking and seeing things go by at the same time was able to walk normally. Whereas the cat in the gondola that was just seeing things go by in its ocular, its, its vision, its visual field, its optic field as JJ Gibson would say, this theory is built on that, uh, could not walk, was, could not see the depth of things, you know, much, much similar to like the hunters that were, uh, you know, in, in the uh, forest and 
thick forest and all they see was like distances like this their whole lives but then they were taken out in the field and they could not perceive a, a buffalo correctly that was way out in the field because the right so that that hypothesis there was exactly as you just said if we don't have the correct environment that also will affect our cognitive processes it's not just having a body it's having an environment and the relationship between that environment and the body that needs to be addressed so to so to uh tie the thread sense? together I I... yeah yeah no okay. very clear so to tie the thread together we're talking about reductionism and finding the properties of holes and the parts and that there are times where the nature of the interaction of the parts the networks of dynamics that the parts have together end up being critical to the behavior of the whole system right synergy defined as the behavior of whole systems unpredicted by the behavior of the parts taken separately and That's complex right. systems are particularly synergistic systems yes and so then we we kind of jumped without saying it to the topic of consciousness and looking for consciousness in association with the brain and then saying well we see that when people are in different states of subjective experience and we have them hooked up to EEGs to different brain monitoring devices, we'll see correlates between certain neural states and certain conscious states. But the fact that we see correlates doesn't mean that we don't see correlates anywhere else and doesn't mean that you have one directional causation, meaning that the brain right. is causing the mind exclusively and also doesn't mean that you have perfect correlation. These are all kind of the assumptions that when we started to see the correlation we figured would maybe happen in the reductive models of mind as a result of brain. Right. But now we're extending it to say, well, maybe uh, it's not just brain, but brain and nervous system and body. <clears throat> but then it's brain, nervous system, body taking in the environment. And so then we start to think about mind not as an emergent property of brain, but as an emergent property of the relationship of self with the universe. Exactly right. I mean that. Well, yes, exactly right. That would. That's a. Um, in my in in the paper that we just we just um, we just got we just wrote then and, and also in my talk I, I sort of boil it down to that right. The brain is a dynamical system and the mind is an emergent, self-organizing process um, that exists. That it's an embodied process that exists in a relationship with the external world, with the universe. As you, as you say, so that's how I would define the mind and cognition and cognitive processes and, and probably even consciousness as well. I would say that consciousness and not to jump the gun or anything, but uh, right. But consciousness requires um, embodiment and subjectivity requires dynamics, uh, meaning a relationship uh, that through time that evolves, uh, uh, you know, a relation, a dynamical relationship that be between the environment and the body itself. In both sensory and motor processes, as you were mentioning. Yes. So we, we have this diagram um, in the paper where uh, it, it's like you have the box of the brain and then the brain exists in a body and the body exists in the environment. And inside the brain um, you have what you're, what you're, what you've just alluded to now, sensory and motor system, sensory systems, the motor systems, and the interactions between the sensory and the motor systems back and forth. And it actually exists in a hierarchical level um, in this what's called action perception cycle. Some people will call it the perception action cycle. So um, yeah, and the, the limbic system is highly involved and uh, creates um, an integration, let's say, of, of space and time and it goes on and on from there, but just this is actually, right. actually fun because we actually define the mission statement of NeuroHacker in relationship to complex systems at one point, which was that's uh, what led me to you. Yeah, so we we defined it as that all complex systems have a, a triplicate of these three properties that define their adaptiveness, that are what has them evolve, which is uh, sensory input of information from the environment information processing, modeling of that, and then actuator output in a closed loop. And so it's not just input and output, there's processing in between, which takes the input, makes sense of it, right? Sense making to then be able to inform a decision, be able to act on it. And then again, if it, we have to be able to in turn sense the effect of the action on the world. So the cat pushes a little bit, the carousel, and it moves a little bit, it pushes yeah. a lot, moves a lot. And it's sensing and it's action are both informing its sense-making, its ability to understand, right? They're all co-informing, co-evolving. So right. um, 
No, it's exactly right. Um, yeah, and, and not to not to interrupt you again, just so I want to, don't want to forget this point. But that's, that was the heart of our paper that we that we wrote is is the idea that um, you know, so my advisor's advisor is Walter Freeman, as I was mentioning to you before, uh, who just died last year, and he was a pioneer in applying complex systems to brain sciences. He was the guy, the, the pioneer to, to applying nonlinear dynamics. He has actually what's called his own Freeman's nonlinear neurodynamics uh, to understanding the brain, like chaos theory to understanding the brain. What he said, what his work shows, I believe, is that exactly what you're saying, the, it's not just the brain and the body is not just a stimulus response. It's not like a computer in that way, right? Garbage in, garbage out, right? There's a whole bunch of, um, you know, this is the idea of perception being active right, or constructive perception is constructive it's not like a camera that just records a one-to-one isomorphism between reality it just doesn't record it actually so you get sensory information that gets transduced and then processed but um what freeman showed one of what is one of the first to show is that actually a lot of what you perceive is driven by endogenous input by the brain's own internal activity the milieu of what's going on in the neurons in the brain is actually producing what you see almost sometimes more than what the external environment is producing what you see. And so that's another perception. way of saying that learning is possible. Yes. The, is- it, the endogenous input is based on previous experience so that we're actually right. making meaning of. I can't believe you said that. That's, that's exactly right. So Freeman thought that the brains are dynamical systems that are in the business of creating meanings, not responding to stimuli. That's what organisms do. That's, that's perfect that you said that. Uh, and that's what the whole paper is about, yeah. So when Viktor Frankl said, uh, you know, yeah. between action, b- between stimulus and response is the last human freedom. Um, yes. Paraphrasing that, it's actually key insight here. But so just the mission statement, how we had it, uh, Sorry, yeah. and I'll actually link this in the show notes, is in, in their most abstracted cases, sensory input, we're relating to sentience the ability to actually take in and have some experience of anything. The information processing we're relating to intelligence, the ability to make sense of and make meaning of that sentience and the actuator output to agency, the capacity to make choices and navigate in the world. Right. And that those three are actually like X, Y, Z axis. They're an orthonormal basis for defining Mm -hmm. what adaptiveness means what sovereignty means and so that our goal here is how do we actually optimize people's sentience intelligence agency and the triplicate between them so there's that creates a coordinate system it creates a space of possibility right so i love this idea of thinking about not only spatial extension about space but also like different spaces like a state space so in complex systems we think about a phase space or a, a relationship space or a connectivity space this is what i actually study that's my research, particularly. Um, and so this triplicate, you know, orthonormal basis forms of space. And um, that space describes all of this, this um, possibility of optimization that you're talking about. And there's parts in that space where things are non-optimal and there's parts in that space where things are optimal, where, where it's possible, like where, you know, human optimization is, is going to be the, the, the most... Uh, um, which is going to come to fruition, I guess, or manifest itself the most, I should say. So that's an interesting thing that you're saying. So let's I- jump from the philosophy to the practical there regarding optimization and say, you know, reductionism did a good job with polio because polio really did have an acute cause, right? There's pretty much one cause that if you address it, you do a pretty good job with it. Uh, medicine has not done a great job with cancer or right. Alzheimer's or neurodegenerative disease in general or autoimmune disease because they don't have one cause, right? right. And so when you're dealing with multifactorial dynamics, reductionism doesn't work as well because you're looking for one thing that is off and it's some weighted set of many things with exactly. delayed time causation, and, right. which is why a complex systems approach to not only medicine, but also uh, medicine has not done a good job with mental illness or psychiatry, right? We don't uh-huh. have cures for anxiety or for depression. We have symptomatic treatments that all have side effects and are just treatments. And so 
that doesn't mean these things aren't curable. It just means we need an approach that can look at the complexity of the dynamics that are leading to these altered homeodynamics and can actually address them, which is our whole goal here. So talk yeah. to us about that a little bit. Talk to us about as someone studying complexity applied to neuroscience, as you're thinking about the future of psychiatry, psychology, neuroscience, medicine, some of the, some of your thoughts. Ah, oh, yeah. The, um, so I think that, again, just from a personal viewpoint, a personal standpoint, I was looking to study. I was inspired by, I'll get to your point in a second. I just want to say this. I was inspired by Paul and Patricia Churchland, who, who started this field of neurophilosophy. And they said, uh, all the, like, they, they basically said, where does philosophy go from here into the brain? And so I was interested in trying to solve these problems, these complex problems, by looking into the brain and, and seeing, uh, explain consciousness by looking into the brain, like we've already talked about. So I didn't know anything about complex systems. Um, I have found out complex systems when I, when I entered this degree and started studying at the Center for Complex Systems and Brain Sciences and realized that the methodology of looking at the brain from a complex systems or complexity science viewpoint actually has, has wide applicability and leads to a whole bunch of other things. I went to the New England Complex Systems Institute in, at MIT for two weeks a couple summers ago and, and we studied uh, ethnic conflict, ethnic violence, we studied healthcare, um, swarm behavior, um, even dermatology. There was a dermatologist in my group studying, um, you know, why people get a rash here, right, and, or, you know, and not here or something like that, or why this person physiological has this physiological response on their skin and this person doesn't, from a complex systems viewpoint. So I think that um, you're absolutely right. Uh, we've talked about these limits of reductionism and this new kind of complexity science that's emerging to try and explain and describe and also make predictions. So am I getting to your question now? I mean, I think I don't want to get all too off topic. or too You're, saying, you're saying that complexity is being applied to things. Um, right. Do you, can you say more about um, and whether you want to go into complexity or to embodied cognition, um, how a more complete approach to understanding the relationship between the mind and brain affects how we would go about affecting the mind? Yeah, so I think, right. I mean, even in my particular research, so I study causality, actually, uh, and I study brain networks. So we're using network science uh, applied to the brain. Like, and now people are using all kinds of network science to apply to everything, including things like healthcare and economies and markets and um, all kinds of things. And even uh, terrorist networks, counterterrorism is using complex systems to study, uh, to apply graph theoretic approaches to how different cells communicate and different hubs and, and things like that. So that's the sort of approach that I'm using in my own research to study large scale brain networks. And I, uh, my general um, viewpoint is that cognition and cognitive processes do originate in the brain, but they, that's a, a it's a necessary, but not a sufficient condition for cognitive processes or, or things like attention and perception and memory and language. They also require the body. They also require movement. They also, they require embodiment movement and a dynamical relationship with the external world as we've already said so um like for example working memory uh network between different aspects of the brain and how information flows from one area of the brain to another area of the brain um so you set up this so what i'm doing in my research actually just to briefly tell you is we're um we're using nonlinear dynamical systems which imitate or simulate brain data neuroimaging data and then we set up the connectivity between those regions and then we try and recover that connectivity using different methodologies that are now becoming widely popular in complex systems in general so there was just a conference in cancun i think uh in april um now there's a lot of conferences by the way in complex systems and they're they're, they're, they're huge they're big um and one was in cancun where they were talking about all these different topics and one of the biggest tops topics was using causal analysis to try and locate the information flow in these networks, whether it be a terrorist network or a brain network or a social network or something like that. So um, just to sum up, I think like, that's my area of research. And we, we, like, we used to think, right, that 
from phrenology, right? That, that this part of the brain does this, this part of the brain does that, you know, over here, this part of the brain does this. We now know that that's not what happens. We now know that cognitive processes are largely subserved, right, by the interaction, the dynamical interaction of all these different brain areas. So the, the idea is to examine that connectivity. There's different kinds of connectivity, functional connectivity, causal connectivity, structural connectivity. So we've actually found, to go back to embodiment, to take this, is, is there's this concept of metastability, which exists in, coordinate, in the field of coordination dynamics, which was largely started by uh, Scott Kelso and my advisor, Stephen Bressler in the Center for Complex Systems and Brain Sciences, where different parts of the brain have a tendency to coordinate uh, but they also have a tendency to compete. So they have a tendency, a simultaneous tendency to integrate, but then also to want to do their own thing and be autonomous and segregate. And it's this perfect balance of integration and segregation that allows for cognitive processes to, to take place. Um, so that's the concept of metastability. Now this concept of metastability in the brain is also being explored in other areas as well. Like you, we started off this conversation, um, you know, economies, social coordination, um, markets, swarm behavior, all kinds of, of, of different things. So for, again, I don't want to assume that the terms are familiar. Would you okay. define yes. a nonlinear system? Right. So, um, there's different ways to define it mathematically or just conceptually. So math, let's t start off with mathematically. Um, you have a mathematical function, right? I don't want to get too uh, complicated or, or complex, <laughs> no pun intended, but um, it's, it's sort of uh, necessary. Um, that's actually one of the things that, that, I, like, that I do is, is, is what's called computational neuroscience or mathematical neuroscience. So one of the things we're learning is how to appropriate mathematics and writing things down to describe them. So that's one of the, the you see that in all complex systems, in all complex systems, trying to describe this complex behavior through mathematics through the language of mathematics. Actually, a great book. Let me just get another book on my desk here. Um, this is a phenomenal, phenomenal book by John Gottman, one of the top psychologists. This is called um, The Mathematics of Marriage, uh, Dynamic Nonlinear Models. So this is a phenomenal book about modeling different properties of marriages and relationships and seeing if you could model that and then make predictions from that mathematical model. It's fascinating, his results. So he's actually affiliated with the center, but... So dynamic nonlinear models. So a linear model, right, is a model where you can, you, you um, like we said before, conceptually, you take the parts and you add them up and you just get the addition of those parts, right? Um, it's we say for simplicity where the outputs are proportional to the inputs. Exactly right, right. The mm -hmm. linear models where the outputs are directly proportional to the, to the inputs. And a nonlinear model is just not that. The outputs are unexpected and not directly proportional to the inputs. You put a little input into something and you could, you would, in a linear system, you would get a little output. You put a little input probably to a nonlinear or, or superb, to a nonlinear system and you get a large or an unexpected output. Um, mathematically, as I was saying, you know, f of x plus f of y equals f of x plus y. So you have a function of x, a function of y. You add those two functions together and you just get one function that is the superposition of both of those individual functions. Right? So that's one, one mathematical definition of linear, linearity. And so a nonlinear system is a system such that um, you cannot add up the individual functions to a system uh, that will just be the superposition of those functions. So we can see a bunch of dynamics happening in the brain, but you can't right. add up those dynamics to explain what's happening in the brain in a really clear way. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, the brain is a nonlinear dynamical feedback system um, in the sense of it's uh, you, uh, I mean, the, a neuron, a single neuron itself is a dynamical system. Um, it goes through things called bifurcations where, you know, it could, or symmetry breaking, like I mentioned earlier on the podcast, you know, where, you know, a neuron is doing something where it's silent, it's quiescent, right? And you just give it a little tiny input and boom, it bursts like, like this. You know, it starts doing this bursting behavior. Um, and the reason for that is you, you look at the mechanics of a neuron, you know, the input of sodium, the output of potassium, and so on and so forth. Um, so you look at, you look at those. So even one neuron is a nonlinear dynamical system. The whole brain itself. And when we think of a, 
uh, an input that doesn't have proportional output, where a tiny input might be a huge output, or a huge input might produce a tiny output or an unexpected one. Right. Seems like, all right, well, that's just chaos. But we're actually not talking about chaos here. We're talking about complexity and metastability, meaning that you have feedback between these different nonlinear systems that create different stable states, and the system can move between these different stable states. Right. Or unstable states. Like, so, so right. like, right. So, I mean, you have um, these equilibria, these fixed points in the system and a stable equilibria is one where, you know, the system is here, like, a, um, you know, a, take a neuron, for example. Um, if a neuron is doing something and it, it, it might be in a stable state where if you perturb it, it will do something else, but then it'll return back to what it was doing. Right. Whereas an unstable state is a neuron is like, let's say, quiescent or just, you know, uh, relaxing in a relaxed, in a resting state. Right. And you just perturb it a little bit and all of a sudden it, it, it explodes and gets far away from what it's doing and never returns to back in what it's doing. So nonlinear dynamical systems is a mathematical apparatus that actually describes what neurons do um, and then what the whole brain does. So that's the idea of nonlinear dynamical systems and metastability and you brought in chaos, so neurons are chaotic, and some people, like my advisor's advisor, advisor Freeman, thought the brain was chaotic, in a sense. Um, so that's debatable whether the brain is actually a, a chaotic system, but there are definitely like, so the neuronal populations, I studied neuronal populations, so a population of 10,000 neurons here, and a population of 10,000 neurons here and their connectivity, this whole population of neurons here is actually chaotic meaning that um, it's very sensitively dependent on initial conditions, meaning that, you know, if you, if you um, for your listeners, right, they, they probably heard of the butterfly effect, just to, not to get into chaos too much, but, um, you know, it, uh, a butterfly flaps its wings in Texas and creates a hurricane in the Caribbean. That's back to meteorology and Edward Lorenz. That's not, that's more metaphorical. The idea is that um, you put a small little input and you get you would think if you have a system and if you put one tiny little input here, but then you put, you, then you let the system run and then you put another tiny input very, very close to the first tiny input, you would think that the system would run in the very same manner that it did in the first one, in the first case. But a chaotic system is very, very sensitive to those initial inputs. So those initial inputs can be really, really, really infinitely so close on the order of like, many magnitudes, but then you would get widely, widely different behaviors in the system. And so a chaotic neuronal population or a chaotic brain allows for neural flexibility. The brain is very, very flexible. Um, it's able to like, you know, uh, ignore large amounts of information, which is necessary to survival. It's, 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 it's enabled to adapt. It's enabled, it's uh, neuronal populations and the brain itself is a very, very flexible system. And that's what that, chaos leads to i'm hoping i'm hoping that people listening are just starting to think about the brain and the just sheer volume of stuff that's happening right when we're talking about tens of billions of neurons and we're talking about trillions of synaptic connections between them mm -hmm. and this level of sensitivity to initial conditions and what single neurons are doing what small networks what large networks are all of that interacting with the environment, all of it interacting with the body, um, st storing information and then taking in new information and factoring the stored information simultaneously. And the fact that we're not just goo, right? That it doesn't just entropically dissolve into goo instantly, um, that there is able to be homeodynamics at all. Right. That level of complexity is just like, it should be awe inspiring um, and humility inspiring and fascination yes. inspiring. And yes, maybe make you want to go do a PhD in complexity neuroscience. That's um, <laughs> correct. So That's description. Whenever, whenever we think about psychiatry or biohacking for cognitive enhancement or anxiety or whatever, we're, we're talking about ways we can affect the body that are going to affect the mind or the psyche. Yeah. And so we're looking at the fact that mind body are linked and that the body to the mind direction has some causal dynamics that we can work with. Right. Now, we don't have to have any deep philosophy of mind to say 
is the mind emergent property of the body of the brain is is mind fundamental and their interact it actually doesn't matter to just say there is some coupling and there is at least some causal dynamics in the direction of body to mind we might also say there's causal dynamics in the direction of mind to body um right, right. self self-induced neuroplasticity direction well i mean like to get into not to cut you off but the and i want you to go on and say but the the, the question with uh, you you're right you don't need a philosophy of mind to to talk about those things i, I think you're absolutely right but the, the central question is right, if if the mind is an emergent property if consciousness is an emergent property of the brain the question becomes are emergent properties real what does that mean to say and then you get into a whole philosophy of whether it's just in terms of predictability whether it's in terms whether it really exists and blah 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 so but i totally agree with what you're saying and the, the thread of what you're saying it's it's you're really spot on yeah, and I wouldn't say that we um, that saying that mind is an emergent property of brain is something that is a solid agreement across philosophy of mind. Right? We've right. got um, we've got consciousness as fundamental interpretations. We have dualist interpretations. We have all different kinds of things. So um, right. we could have a whole deep conversation on philosophy of mind, which would be fun. And for those who um, who aren't even very familiar with it, but are just curious, like what is physics? Like what is m matter and energy and charge and weight and that stuff? And what is consciousness, which is like filled with feeling and emotion and impulse and thought and like totally different kind of stuff. Like what are those two universes of stuff and how do they relate? Well, That's let me, let, problem. let me quote, let me quote Erwin Schrodinger who wrote a very, very famous book. What is life, which started molecular bi biology and in the chapter called The Arithmetic Paradox, he starts off that chapter by saying, the reason that the sentient, percipient ego can be found nowhere in the objective universe can be easily answered in seven words, because it is itself that, that world. Yeah. Because it is itself that world. Yeah. So, so seven words. Right. So absolutely. Yeah. We're in yeah. the same there's actually a, a really fun book Ken Wilber put together uh, when he was young called Quantum Questions, which was yes, yes. basically just the, uh, the quantum physicists who really developed modern physics. It was their philosophic musings on what is the nature of reality as indicated by what they're seeing in quantum mechanics. And what was so fun was, you know, this is Einstein and Schrodinger and Heisenberg and who all came from classic philosophy of science and then saw just the most phenomenally weird things in quantum mechanics. Yeah. And their their philosophy all sounded quite a bit more like Vedanta or Taoism than um, the Upanishads. The yeah, yeah. So uh, actually, that's a great book if people want to check it out. And if anyone wants to check out whether they agree with him or not, David Chalmers' framing of what he calls the hard problem to even understand the problem of what consciousness right. is, what brain is, and why there is a, a a very deep philosophic topic. It's a good place to go start. Absolutely. David Chalmers is a leader in the philosophy of mind. Uh, so the question I have for you is yeah, go ahead. when we come back to however they're coupled, body affects mind, and not just brain affects mind, but body and movement and dynamics affect mind. Right. So uh, if someone is wanting to understand that in a way that they can apply, um, you you focus on specific types of exercise and lifestyle specifically not just for health and longevity but for mind dynamics we talk about that yeah absolutely uh so i was trying to connect these ideas like you're like you did so well just a moment ago about um the essential notion of embodied mind uh which is like we talked about a big field in, in the philosophy of mind and now neuroscientists are starting to look at that um not Two, not just philosophers, neuroscientists are starting to look for um, explanation of cognitive processes in terms of how the body uh, moves. And so I, I thought to myself, um, I, you know, the, the idea of coordination dynamics, um, which was started by, like I said, Scott Kelso and my advisor, and um, their application of coordination dynamics to um, limb movement, right? And then not only that, but different areas of the brain coordinating in different ways, like in metastability and different people coordinating in different economies and things. 
markets and things like that. But I was thinking, well, if that's the case, um, <clears throat> how can we connect coordination dynamics and this notion of embodiment uh, to, to my other area of interest, which is, is fitness? And um, fitness is movement. Movement affects cognition. The mind uh, movement is a requirement for the mind. So I thought that there, uh, you, maybe there's some studies now that, that are showing that can actually – uh, give him some empirical evidence of this. And I looked and it turns out there are, there are plenty of studies now showing that how different patterns of movement affect the brain and therefore cognition. You see a lot of articles are coming out. Uh, a lot of studies are, are now are, are coming out every year and it increases at a rate at a certain rate about uh, what, you know, running does for functional connectivity of the prefrontal cortex or <clears throat> something. I even just read a, a the study that I put in my talk, which just came out last year, I think, showing that um, that expert practitioners of Tai Chi, which is a contemplative, interoceptive pattern of movement with the body, affects their proprioception of their body. And those people who are expert practitioners of Tai Chi are less susceptible to what has been called the rubber hand illusion. Um, so we're, we're given this body schema, and our, our brain has this body schema, and sometimes that goes wrong. Sometimes we think that uh, sometimes people have alien syndrome, alien hand syndrome rather, like where you know, they, they don't think their hand is their, belongs to them or something like that. So this sense of belongingness to our, our body and how we move it, uh, gestures, we, those things, uh, even fine handwriting skills like this, fine motor skills of playing the guitar or an instrument, um, or even you know, like, like cursive writing can actually – there's all kinds of uh, evidence showing that that affects cognitive processes and learning and being better at logic or mathematical reasoning or spatial reasoning or something like this. So um, I wanted to tie all those areas together, movement, fitness, and embodied cognition. So that's, that's, so what I do is I um, I'm used to be very interested in, in weightlifting and, um, and different cardio, like running and things like that. I lifted all my life and uh, on and off you know, of course, but, um, th those days of, of those kinds of fitness are kind of like, um, old, right. The days of Arnold Schwarzenegger and Jack LaLanne and those people, those, those bodybuilders are kind of uh, antiquated. Now people are more into like body weight, um, movement and, uh, you know, you hear about this, what's called floor surfing, for example, I just learned about that term recently. So you have all these different movement camps out there like Edo Portal, and Mike Fitch, who has this animal flow, which has started here in Miami. Um, there's Erwin LaCour's uh, Evolve, Move, Play. There's Move Nat. So there's all these different primal movements out there that are focusing on just getting on the floor and doing things in a different way, and much like you know the, the experiment that I was talking about in the beginning, uh, uh, early in the podcast, the cat experiment, Heinenheld's cat experiment. You know, different, seeing how your optical field flows on the ground versus up, up higher, and so. People are getting back to that now. Uh, I should getting back to that. What I mean, I say like getting back to like crawling and just moving on the floor and things that we used to do is uh, maybe way back in our ancestral days or even as children or something like that. So different levels of play. And I think there's a direct connection between those different kinds of movement and cognitive processes. And that's really the bottom line. So I try to incorporate different patterns of movement um, on myself and, not I'm on one, I'm N equals one to see how, you know, those are affecting my cognitive processes, but there's evidence that they do. So, so we have a, some very general insights, which is that movement at all is going to affect cognitive process in a very generalized systemic way through, let's say, you know, endocrine effects if, um, or genetic transcription effects that okay, right. exercise is going to increase BDNF. And so you're going to get more neurogenesis it's going to increase um, androgen production, growth hormone production, so nitric oxide production, right? Like those right. basic things. And it kind of doesn't matter what type of exercise. Some will do that more than others, but they're all going to do that a little bit. And that's going to affect neurological health writ large, which will affect cognitive process. But then we can go deeper and recognize that certain body regions and certain types of movement um, and, and certain types of physiologic engagement actually affect cognition in different ways. Yes. So, well, let me take a step back. I mean, there are different patterns. They're kind of finding that different patterns of movement affect different kinds of cognitive processes, right? So, like I said, like you're right, brain-derived neurotrophic factors will increase, which will, you know, lead to more 
neuroplasticity or neurogenesis in certain areas of the brain involved with learning and memory, like the hippocampus. Running will increase functional connectivity in the prefrontal cortex. Um, maybe high intensity interval training, they're sort of theoretically, well, empirically, I should say, finding that affects cerebrovascular function or, or something like that in certain areas of the brain rather than others. So there are, there are different patterns. I think there are probably a category of different patterns of movement that will affect different areas of the brain, which will then affect different cognitive processes in general. Um, it's still unclear, right? It's, it's still, a, it's still a, a very large work in progress, right? We still right. don't know. So, um, I don't know what, I don't remember where the study was published from, but I saw a study not long ago of a neuroscientist who was looking at regions of the body that mapped to regions of the brain and okay. was hypothesizing that exercising mm -hmm. specific regions might have specific kinds of psychocognitive effects and specifically ended up finding that working abs had more effect on decreasing anxiety than working any other muscle group in the body. Okay, that I, didn't, I haven't heard of. That. That's very interesting, though. Um, and it wasn't being postulated that it was because it was affecting the viscera and the gut brain. It was because... I was going to say actual, the vagus nerve. It was the innervation to the abs specifically affecting brain regions that were involved in anxiety. That was the hypothesis. Okay. That's now, that seems to me to be kind of at the cutting edge of a new level of insight where you could actually have, well, like, therapeutic exercise programs. That would be very, very interesting. I mean, <laughs> that's, um, and there, there are probably all these kinds of things that are happening that we don't even know. That's what I'm saying. It's a large work in progress. But what I'm really fascinated about is like, so take yoga, for example. We now know that, well, I, well, I don't want to say it that definitively. We now know. But I will say that some studies are suggesting that yoga has different impacts on brain waves like alpha waves. Um, decreasing gray matter in the amygdala, which is involved with fear and anxiety, right? And increasing neuronal generation or neuronal connectivity in other areas of the brain that are involved with compassion. So you know, this is very interesting. So you like have, or empathy, for example. Um, so you have this, this let, let's like take away for a sec, take, take away for a second, the, the connection of yoga to a philosophy, like Hindu philosophy or something like that. And just look at it as a pattern of movement. That is, simultaneously timed with the breath. Okay. Yeah. So, so just that, I think it's fascinating that even so Western yogis, there's this big uh, movement on Instagram, right. With, with yogis putting their poses and, and uh, you know, having these, these deep insights or something like that. Um, I, I just think that it's, it's fascinating to me that, um, that this pattern of movement can affect those kinds of cognitive cognition or those kinds of cognitive processes like compassion or empathy, right? You really don't find, you find a lot of yogis who might be vegetarian or, or vegan or something like that. I don't know what the exact numbers are, but um, it, it's just, it's just phenomenal to me that you have this direct connection between a system of movement and a cognitive process, right? Like, or not even a cognitive process for a mental state, like right. empathy or something like that. So there, there to me that, that direct link exists the direct correlation exists. I don't know if it's actual causation. It could be. Um, and I guess in, in my whole thing, I'm actually assuming there is causality. You do this pattern of movement, it's, you're going to change. <laughs> I mean, it's obviously hard when people are um, studying yoga and there really is a cultural context that is implicit and there's a whole set of aesthetics that are implicit. So there is right. you know, selection bias. And But I think, I think it is fair to say, you know, when we just look at the pattern of movements of yoga, compared to most other exercise systems, it's kind of fascinating because you've got stretching of the whole body and strengthening of the whole body and balance and inversion and, you know, blood, cerebral blood flow dynamics and right. increased conscious proprioception and breath. And like, it was, it was really a pretty complete system, you know, complex system in yeah. terms of all the different things you'd want to engage in a movement system. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, um, and it's widely applicable, like people of all ages, all different kinds of geographical and demographical, you know, demographics can do yoga, which is, is even makes it more complete. I mean, not, well, they're, they're octogenarian marathon runners. I'm not, don't, don't, don't get me wrong. But uh, yeah, no, I, I think that's fascinating. And one of the, the uh, causal links, it could be, like we actually mentioned, the vagus nerve. Um, so the effect of yoga on something like heart rate variability, um, which can now be measured. It's, it's, there's different algorithms to measure it. It's, it seems to be uh, quite difficult to get at. Um, 
reliably. Uh, but uh, that could be a link between this system of movement and this different kind of mental state, right? Or mental awareness or cognitive process, mm -hmm. um, like perception. Like, it, well, even go back to, I mentioned this, like posture. Posture has been linked to uh, psychology and psychological aspects, but we're now linking posture to uh, neurobiological aspects, mm -hmm. right? So th there can actually be effects of posture on the brain and the way the brain perceives the external world. So there's, that's not a system of movement like yoga, but it's another empirical example of the, the, the effect of movement and the body on different kinds of cognitive processes. So we're talking about fitness. So There's a program I'm not sure if you've seen, but I just want to let uh, people listening know. If you go to the website, mm -hmm. zingup.com, Z-I-N-G-U-P.com, it's uh, Winford Dorr who... Uh, CEO of that company is a friend and we did quite a lot of dialogue. His daughter had autism and he, uh, right. wealthy guy. And, um, after selling some businesses and just decided to, uh, bring all the neuroscientists that were having some good insights in autism together and try and create a program. And, um, <clears throat> he, the current program is not advertised as having anything to do with autism, just performance enhancement. Okay. Uh, in the studies on, uh, someone juggling an IQ going up three points when they get juggling down or learning how to drum and then learning to drum with the opposite non-dominant hand stuff. So what they have is an entire program of just really hard coordination exercises based on tests. And the moment you start to get it, it moves to a new one because the insight that they found was that in the beginning of doing some uh, motor sensory motor coordination type activity, but you can't do it all. You're starting to ride a bike and you're going to fall over there's a threat signal that actually drives radical neurogenesis to figure it out okay. because yeah. in an evolutionary environment, it would have been like, whoa, fuck, it's not safe to not be able to do this thing. Right. And so you have this very fast uptake of new neural network formation. And then you start to get decreasing returns as you go into skill perfection of just new in terms of neural network dynamics. And so the moment, and of course that doesn't mean you're getting good at the skill. It just means you're, if you're trying to drive neurogenesis, right, then you do it. And as soon as you start to get the hang of it, you switch and do something else. Right. As soon as you start to get the hang, you switch and do something else. And they found that they've got this 10 minutes a day program that within six months, they had 18% increased volume in the cerebellum, um, which was phenomenal. They saw 11 points increase in IQ in a teenager study and decrease in violence and um, criminal populations with no psychology involved at all. And they were basically looking at the limbic brain and the basal structures of the brain having increased capacity to process information, increasing our cognitive capability, our athletic capability, but also our psychological capability because people could actually process the input without going into reaction. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and the, the whole thing and, and why it increased rate of learning specifically, that aspect of intelligence, their hypothesis was our ability to automate new learning right so you're trying to drive the stick shift and it takes all of your attention or trying to ride the bike it takes all of your attention and eventually you can do it without even thinking about it it was evolutionarily critical for us to take some new skill that required our conscious attention if and if we're going to do it regularly learn to automate it so the conscious attention be free to scan the environment exactly yeah so whatever we're doing regularly our brain automates but their idea was that the the thing the things that we were doing the most for the automation of learning were sensory motor dynamics and so you actually get the most neurogenesis there. And then it's actually that same neurological infrastructure that cognitive knowledge, uh, interpersonal knowledge also runs over. And so that was the hypothesis. If we do the sensory motor stuff, can we affect the brain a lot in ways that will then affect learning math or language or anything else? And it has shown up that way. So I think that's pretty exciting and fascinating that is amazing uh, four things to say about that <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> uh, okay, let me see if i remembered all of them <laughs> that's yeah that's amazing i haven't uh, heard about that but um but in my own uh so a shameless plug in my own in my own uh, in my own fitness uh, paradigm that i have which i'm calling embodied fitness so that's the shameless plug there um so I'm trying to to build a website and and to uh, which I'll launch pretty soon. Um, and it's called uh, it's actually called embodiedfit.com, although it's not launched yet for your for your listeners. But embodied fitness. So that's 
And in, in my own uh, <clears throat> paradigm, I actually do what you're talking about. Um, so I, cool. I, yeah, so like I, I go to the park right here and um, I just recently, two months ago, took up the bow staff. Um, so I have my bow staff right here and, uh, you know, I'll put videos up of me doing it on my, my, my website. But, you know, you just do it, doing spinning motions like this, spinning behind or something like this and just learning the coordination and learning a sense of space around you. I mean, it, it might be a leap to say that's going to change certain cognitive processes in my brain and, and might change my personality. That's not what I'm saying. But um, to, 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 that's exactly what you're, you're talking about with this, um, with what you were just talking about. And like juggling, for example, I do juggling. I juggle three balls and now I'm learning to juggle four. And, you know, it takes, these things take time, obviously, like riding a bike or learning to drive a stick shift, right? So it depends how much time people have. But, you know, just in the shower, brushing your teeth, you hear this all the time, brushing your teeth with your, your opposite hand. Um, and uh, those things have effects down the road on, I think, cognitive processes. So that, that's one thing to say. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right that, that uh, learning new things, there's this threshold in neural networks where they, they, you know, artificial neural networks are learn, right? Unsupervised or supervised learning, for example, they call it machine learning. But neural networks, natural neural networks, they, they do learn and there is this threshold of, of adaptation, what's called neural adaptation that has happens with sensory adaptation as well. So we don't, we don't realize that we're wearing a shirt now. When we put the shirt on, we first feel it, but then the neurons adapt and we don't feel it. So the same sort of things neurons do adapt and you need to constantly change them. The other thing I was going to say related to that is this idea of neurogenesis, right? So different kinds of exercise do promote neurogenesis. Um, neurogenesis meaning the creation of new neurons, not only the creation of connections between already existing neurons. The thing though is, uh, well, at least one thing that we're finding out now is that neurogenesis only happens at certain areas of the brain. Right? So neuroplasticity is, is global in that sense. Neurogenesis is, is rather local. Um, so for example, there's a couple places in the brain where neurogenesis happen. Um, the hippocampus which is the space for learning and memory, at least where that initially happens, and then it's consolidated in all these kinds of networks in the brain in the neocortex, right? But in the limbic system, the center of the brain, um, the hippocampus, there's uh, another area is the subventricular zone, which uh, the ventricles on the outer edges of the ventricles, neurogenesis happens. I mean, it makes sense that neurogenesis happens. You can get new neural growth, actually, new neurons to grow, um, late in life in the place where, you know, you're learning it for something new, which happens to do with survival. So from an evolutionary perspective, it makes sense that, that neurogenesis would happen in the hippocampus. So learning new, like, so it's not only learning skills like a new language, which you hear can prevent or, you know, slow down Alzheimer's or something like that, but there might be evidence that learning new motor acts can actually have effects down the road on cognitive processes and in maybe the prevention of, uh, pathological conditions like Huntington's or Parkinson's disease, which are problems within the basal ganglia, right, deep inside the brain, uh, where dopamine is created, right, for, or one of the places where dopamine is created and then sent out to the rest of the brain. So um, learning new motor acts is just generally a very, very good thing, and there's so much evidence that it, it might be a requirement for consciousness, a requirement for having a mind, uh, it changes the mind, um, my whole central tenet of embodied fit is that the how you move changes who you are. Now that's a, a maybe a crude way to put it, right? Um, uh, or or maybe I'm taking a, I don't know, I'm making a leap there, you know, a hasty generalization or something that there's no evidence for, um, right? But it, but it sounds cool, and there might be some evidence for that at the at the, uh, at the level of of science at the state of science now. At the state of science. I'm gonna I'm gonna bite my tongue because we've got a close okay. I, I will just okay. say we have a paper that we uh, wrote and will publish soon but I'll send it to you which is on uh, literature review of adult neural restructuring so it is okay. synaptic cleaving and synaptogenesis neuroautophagy and neurogenesis so okay the breakdown of old structures development of new ones all of the mechanisms um, that we know about in the literature and one of the things that was profound is that there is more neural restructuring capacity into late age from the scientific literature than almost anyone would think about. Yeah. And one of the reasons that we don't 
have that much brain changes because we just get stuck in behavioral patterns where we don't do things that are all that different behavioral Absolutely. perceptual patterns. And that if you could actually get, you know, deep enough behavioral changes that the brain's biological plasticity is actually still pretty profound. Yeah. Even, even later in the age, um, I was just going to say something and I forgot I lost my train of thought because I was listening. Okay, to Cause I had a question for you. My question okay. was, Maybe I'll remember it. embodied fit is not up yet when it is up, we'll share it with people. Thank you. Um, if, uh, and I'm happy you're doing that. Uh, so change the way you move and change the way that you think or are. Uh, if there were some basic things that you were so, going to say were the highest leverage physical movement dynamics for people to engage in, what might you share? Um, okay. Let me think about that. That's a good question. Yeah. Well, but before I say that, I remembered what I was going to say in, in, in the context of what you are all about at Neurohacker Collective, human optimization and uh, individual optimization, right? And that leading to societal optimization. Um, I, I know you have a clear definition of what you mean by optimization. Um, but I think different, learning new motor acts and, and practicing different movement patterns um, is, is a great way, is sort of a biohacking way, right? It's a DIY, do it yourself, uh, a way to to change, to change yourself, I think my personal experience and what, what there's evidence for, objective evidence for, is change who you are for the better. Um, so a way to optimize yourself is to learn different movement patterns. Back to your question uh, about which kinds of movement patterns would do that. Um, again, there's, there's, no, there's no general evidence. There's only evidence about like very, very particular things because that's all we can really do right now in science and, and, and trials. Uh, you know, clinical trials is to, to, to look at, well, how does this thing change this thing? And we, like, let's, let's get rid of all these other confounding effects. Um, one, uh, I mean, this, a study that I talk about in, in, in the talk um, is about strength training and lifting weights. Strength training can actually have effects and decrease uh, white matter tract lesions in elderly women. So that's a very, very specific thing. Like, wow, like lifting weights can actually, you know, do that. That's what, why, what, what is the causal mechanism and why is it doing that? But why is it so specific that that's a scientific question, um, an empirical one that I think could be answered. But my point is that I don't know. I'm, I'm, I would say yoga, um, is probably one of the, uh, we already talked about this. I would definitely say yoga is something very, so very what, profound. What I'm, one of the things with yoga is that, um, yoga is a fairly complex set of dynamics and uh, right. It, as you kind of go through the levels, it keeps changing and, and you keep doing different things. But I'm also hearing high, inter, high intensity interval training has certain effects and yeah. training has other effects and running has other effects yep. and juggling has other effects. So one of the things I'm hearing you say is that people should be yeah. moving and that if there's a movement thing that they've already got really well down, doing something else will provide additional benefit. Right. So there's this learning and stimulation goes. Right, so I consider myself not only a fitness, but probably in, in other things too. I mean, I have three different, wildly sort of different degrees, you know, and uh, in fitness as well, jack of all trades, master of none kind of thing. Um, in fitness, that might be better to be, to have rather than to, or at least in terms of cognitive processes, right, in, in terms of uh, those, those, those kinds of things in that context. Uh, now, don't get me wrong, like you, you don't, um, not, not all, I don't want to say this, you know, or dumb the situation there, you know, for simplicity's sake, but not all athletes, right, are smart, you know, or, or I, I read an article on Big Think a while ago saying this is the exercise for smart people running because it increases the functional connectivity, like I said, in the prefrontal cortex, which is involved in decision making, orienting your goals, thinking about the future, uh, things like that, and also emotional regulation. It's highly involved in emotional regulation. So um, there's that bit of evidence. But yes, learning different new things, taking the time, even if you're not going to get good at them. Um, I do all kinds, like me personally, I can just talk from personal experience. I do all kinds of different things. I love to run. I love to do body weight exercise with the gymnastics rings. Um, I love to trying to master flexibility, mobility, strength, and control just with my body, right? Just with my body and also coordination, right? So, um, so I do all kinds of different things. Like I said, I just took up the bow, something completely new. Um, you know, I do like, I go to a park and I bring my bow and I juggle and I'm trying to learn. I do handstands and, and all kinds of uh, different things like that, but I'm not like a master at any of them, but I try to like dabble 
and become good at each of them. So, so I, I think I think yeah. for people to learn more about, there's an endless resource about that, yeah. What's that? There's an endless resource of, of, of yeah. sets of movement to learn. I think Edo Portal is a good place for people to go learn yeah, more. So since, just, yeah, yeah. Since various movement patterns are what he specializes in. And specifically, he does talk about the uh, evolutionary biology of movement patterns driving neurological growth and cognitive effects. So. so let me just say one more thing. If Ido Portal, um, I've been studying him for a while, and, and I actually prefer uh, Mike Fitch, just to give another plug, and Animal Flow. I think that's fascinating, and I think it captures this idea of embodied fitness very, very well. However, I will say this about Ido Portal. Um, it's funny because the connection was so perfect. And I learned this after I did my talk, but Ido Portal trained Conor McGregor um, for mixed martial arts or whatever it was. I wasn't too sure. But if I, I just started, I was reading Conor McGregor's Wikipedia page. And on the, on the right-hand side, it has all of, uh, Conor McGregor's trainers uh, for different things, right? This one was for nutrition, diet, etc. And for Ido Portal, it was movement. And you could click on the link of movement. Right on that page. So I clicked on the link of movement and it takes you to the Wikipedia page of motor coordination. And if you go down that page and read this section, there's a whole section on coordination dynamics and it mentions Scott Kelso from the Center for Complex Systems and Brain Sciences where I am and um, that whole field. So it was just that, that connection was very um, cool. Very uh, synchronistic from a Carl Jung sense. You know, it was really, cool. it was really cool. Yeah. Well, Michael, this has been fun. I appreciate you being here with us today. And I'm excited Thanks, that you Daniel. are sharing uh, the applied neuroscience fitness work with people soon. We'll share that uh, when it comes. Thanks. We'll share a few soon. links to your TED Talk and um, to some other resources that we have in the show notes that will be useful. And um, if anyone did get inspired to study <laughs> complexity science or complexity neuroscience, awesome. And uh, Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think it's the fun. future. It's the future. It's the uh, future of human optimization, understanding the brain and from a complex systems perspective. Thanks for being here with us. Thanks, Daniel. I appreciate it. Take, Take care. care Bye-bye. You too. Want to learn a better strategy for mental well-being? We designed a beautifully illustrated 32-page guide integrating care for your mind, brain, body, and environment into a balanced approach for a better life. Download the foundational guide to neurohacking at neurohacker.com backslash guide. Thank you for listening to Collective Insights. For the full show notes on this episode and for more great interviews, visit us at neurohacker.com slash collective insights. If you liked this episode, please subscribe to the podcast and leave us a five-star review on iTunes.